Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Bible presentation here this evening. Tonight we have Dan Maluga to speak to us on the topic of the Bible's advice for daily living. Now, as we get started this morning, we're just going to approach God with a word of prayer first. Let's pray. Almighty God, we praise you as that great God Almighty, that God that's created the world, that God that has given to us knowledge. We thank you, God, that you have given to us your word, the Bible, that through that we can gain knowledge, we can gain insight. Please be with us tonight that we might learn from that, that we might be able to come out of tonight knowing better, understanding more about you and learning more about ourselves and how we can interact in this world and to please you. So please, God, watch over us tonight. Help us to learn and to, to learn to serve you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, to introduce the topic for tonight, we're going to read from God's Word for the Bible. We're going to take that reading from Psalm chapter 103. I've got James will now lead us in that reading. Thanks. Reading together Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He makes known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does, he does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, His days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his work, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Thanks. I'll now invite you to hear the topic, the Bible's advice for daily living. Thanks, Dan. And also thank you, James, for that reading. Is it coming through okay at the back? Yep, great. So, as John has said, Uh, Our topic for this evening is the Bible's advice for daily living. So thanks again, James, for that reading of Psalm 103, which uh, contrasts the very great and eternal power of God and his great goodness 
with the frailty and the temporary nature of people upon the earth. You see that uh, we are his children and God is a father to us. And the psalmist, who was King David, writing this psalm about 3,000 years ago, reminds us of how good God is and the great benefits of knowing him. As a community, we firmly believe that the Bible that's before us is the inspired word of God, that he has directed the writing of it to be done in a certain way so as to convey the exact message that he wanted us to get. And therefore, that being the case, we should expect that the Bible would contain a great deal of wisdom and good advice, the best advice for people to live by since it comes directly from our Creator. So that is the, the premise that we, that we come from tonight, that the Bible is the Word of God and that it has a great deal of advice for us both of a, a temporary nature, advice that's good for this life, but also for the one to come, which we will consider at the end, God willing. There might be some, and there are plenty in the world, who would say that the Bible is an old book, and it is. It, it uh, started to be written around three and a half thousand years ago, back when Moses wrote it. It's a very, very old book. Some would say that it's no longer relevant that the lessons it contains or the information it contains was for a certain time, but that time has passed and it's now time for us to move on. Well, uh, I respectfully disagree with that viewpoint and um, would like to show you this evening as we go on the journey together that the Bible has tremendous advice for this day and age as much as any. And uh, we'll see hopefully together a selection of, of great advice, and it's not exhaustive by any means, uh, that, that's very helpful to us. If we think the Bible is, is no longer relevant or that we've kind of passed it by in society, well, I'd like to open by just uh, showing some examples of how much the Bible is actually present in our day and age. So it might be an old book, but it's my contention that it is still very current. And what I'd like to do is just put up 10 sayings. We could literally spend the night on this and, and go for longer, much longer. Um, I'd like to put up 10 sayings that are in our modern vernacular that you may not know are from the Bible, but they most certainly are. And these are sayings that, that have a lot of meaning. They're quite powerful word pictures in many cases and uh, they show that the Bible's teachings and its, and its wisdom remain current. So the first of these is the saying that, that something went by the wayside. It's often expressed in a, in a depressed tone. Someone might be talking in a workplace or talking about general society and they might say, well, this was a, a great thing that used to happen, but that went by the wayside. It's no longer done. And uh, it's normally a lament, isn't it? It's normally not a positive kind of context. Well, that actually comes directly out of Matthew chapter 13, where the Lord Jesus Christ spoke the parable of the sower. So that's where that terminology came from. It's still very current. I think you would agree. What about this one? A man after my own heart. If someone is on the same page as us, if we agree on something, or maybe they do something at just the right time that we were, we were hoping for, we might say to them, oh, you're a man after, or a woman after my own heart. That's, again, straight out of the Bible. It's actually God speaking there, and he's speaking about King David, who at that point was only young, and God says, I've sought me a man after my own heart. So it meant that David and God thought very similarly and that same expression and that same meaning has carried through to our present time. How the mighty have fallen. So those words were actually spoken by David in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 25, where he, he speaks about the death 
of King Saul, who he was to replace, and also the sons of Saul, and in particular, Jonathan, who was a very close friend of David. Um, and so he regarded these as mighty men. And so when they died, he said, how the mighty have fallen. And in our days, we hear this expressed, maybe it's used in a sporting context about someone who's a very great or was a very great athlete or someone in politics or someone who was just known to be quite famous. And uh, when, they, when they fall from their high estate for whatever reason, they might be voted out, they might be very badly injured, they, their conduct might find them out in some way, something comes out of the closet. Um, that's an expression we do find, how the mighty have fallen. So the Bible is in our language. The writing was on the wall. So in Daniel chapter 5, there was a Babylonian king called Belshazzar who held this feast where he essentially mocked God uh, as though God had no real power to overthrow Belshazzar's kingdom. Well, the hand of God wrote on the wall and it quite literally wrote his sentence that uh, his, his time was coming to an end very, very quickly. And indeed, he came to an end that night. Well, again, this is an expression that, that we use. Um, someone may have used it of the, the recent invasion in Ukraine. They might say the forces of the Russian nation built up on the borders of Ukraine over the previous months, the writing was on the wall. There was going to be an invasion. The salt of the earth used to speak of people who are of excellent quality. That again is out of scripture. So Jesus used those words in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13, speaking of his disciples and uh, the idea was that they were to be people of substance and goodness in following him. And we use that same expression these days, don't we, when we think of people who are of great quality, they're the salt of the earth. Go the extra mile. So again, this is Jesus speaking and he, uh, he encouraged his disciples, whoever compels you to go with them a mile will go with them two miles. Go the extra mile. And that's a, an expression that we find perhaps used quite a lot in a business context where people talk about their customers and we say, well, we go the extra mile for our customers. Very, very commonly used, again, straight out of the Bible. Uh, so the Bible's certainly not obscure, is it? We're finding it's popping up in all kinds of contexts. Um, its wording is well known. Wolves in sheep's clothing, speaking of people who are secretly wicked but put on a very good front. It's a bit like they're a wolf, but they've got a, a sheep suit over the top of them. Uh, again, that's an expression we know, and that's from Matthew chapter 7. The blind leading the blind. So uh, maybe in politics, maybe in a business context, you hear it described, people who don't know anything leading people who don't know anything, the blind leading the blind. Again, biblical. You reap what you sow. So it's the picture of if you put good seed in the ground, well, you get good plants. If you put bad seed in the ground, well, you get bad ones. It's the idea of your behaviours and what you do at a certain time, they come up later. You reap what you sow, you get out what you put in. If you're evil, you reap evil. If you're good, you reap good. That's the idea, and that's from Galatians chapter 6, used in the exact same way. And a final one, a drop in a bucket. So that is from Isaiah 40, describing the great power of God, that the nations are just like a drop in a bucket in his sight. So it speaks of um, small things, something very insignificant. Well, we use that same expression these days, don't we? That, that it's an insignificant thing. It's a drop in a bucket. There's many thousands of drops that make up a bucket of water. And that's what the expression means. And again, very commonly used. So there's 10 expressions that we know in our language and we could go on. Um, and we may actually encounter some later that, uh, that you might recognise as well. So the Bible is very relevant, is my contention. But I'd like to just go a little further and show you a couple more examples. Um, just three examples of how our society is actually founded on principles that the Bible contains. So we all know about weights and measures. We go to 
the market. We might buy some apples like that person's doing. Or it might be meat. It might be something like that. Anything by, by weight. There are very um, clear laws written, uh, whether by the authority called weights and measures in some states or trade measurement in other states is their name. Uh, they're very, very um, prominent laws that mean if you buy a kilo, well, you get a kilo. People have scales that are calibrated so that what you pay for is what you get. So we know this very, very well. But you know that comes straight out of the Bible. Look at this as one example. This is out of Leviticus chapter 19, written again about three and a half thousand years ago. So God says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight or in measure, just balances, so the scales that are calibrated and accurate and honest, just weights, a just ephah and a just hin shall you have. I am the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So weights and measures legislation that's a fundamental part of our trading uh, in supermarkets, etc. Well, there it is, way back in, in 1500 BC in the Bible, and it's still as relevant now as ever. What about this one? This one's a bit more severe, but, but you'll recognise it again. It's the law of negligence. We probably hear that, we read about it in the paper, hear it on the news or on the radio. Um, negligence is, is a very serious thing that often comes up. People or institutions had power to do something to prevent an adverse outcome. They didn't do it, so they're negligent and they get the book thrown at them. Well, what the Bible said was a bit more severe, but it made the point and uh, it, it emphasised negligence as a serious thing. So this is talking about a, an ox. So it's got its massive horns and uh, if an ox gore a man or a woman, they die. So it's a serious attack by the ox, then the ox shall surely be stoned, his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. So this thing happened out of nowhere, it's not the owner's fault, but the ox pays the price with its life. But if the ox were want to push with his horn in time past and it hath been testified to the owner, so they've been told, you've got a problem, you've got a dangerous animal, you need to pen it up, and they go, ah, don't care, and it kills someone, well then the ox shall be stoned and the owner actually back then would be put to death, quite, quite severe. But that's, that's negligence and our law has that principle to this day um, and age. Another one, isolation. We don't know anything about isolation, do we? Um, so isolation and quarantine, very similar terms. We've come to know them exceptionally well, most recently because of the unmentionable virus. We'll have a look at this. Back in Leviticus again, this is in the context of the, the plague of leprosy. It was a very serious illness and it was very contagious, a bit like COVID. Look at this, the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be around his head bare, he shall put a covering upon his upper lip. Sounds like a mask, doesn't it? So the idea of a mask, there it is back in Leviticus in 1500 BC. Um, they work quite well unless they end up on the street or in waterways and whatever, which has started to happen unfortunately. But this person was to cry, unclean, unclean, and because they are unclean, they would dwell alone. So these are principles, again, used in the modern world. The Bible being from God, and we would put that this is evidence that, that it is the Word of God. The Bible contained knowledge of germs and contagion, all of those things way back in 1500 BC. Um, and so isolation is there in this, in this context. Um, of, of leprosy, but the principles are uh, extendable to other, other contagious illnesses. So there's three more examples of how the Bible is in our modern language and in our, our society. The principles are still very relevant. And so we therefore put it to you that even though the Bible is old, it remains the base for the laws and perspectives of orderly societies. Some might say, we don't need the Bible, we've got law and order already. Well, we've actually made those laws from the Bible in most cases. That's where they've come from. Uh, so to say, let's get rid of the Bible out of society is to say, well, you're getting rid of pretty much all of the order because all of the order came from it. So therefore, since the Bible is still so relevant, 
there's plenty of advice that we can take from it in this year. And so we, we now want to spend um, a fair bit of time for the rest of our night looking at some advice that the Bible offers us. So firstly, the Bible has great advice with regards to your personal goals. So we all have those, don't we? There's various contexts in which talk about goals and, uh, and the Bible has a bit to say about that. So firstly, um, there's different ways to say this, but I like the expression that enough is better than a banquet. So in life, we hear it in marketing all the time, don't we? Um, and we're encouraged to look at other people and, and get a spirit of envy and jealousy and um, compete with one another. Isn't that what we see in, in society with, with the marketing strategies? Don't be content with what you've got. Look what your friend's got. You should get that as well. Um, it's all very, very good for people making money and so they continue to feed us that line. Well, the Bible gives sensible advice. If we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, so a couple of books over from Psalms that we read from. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Now, for want of a better description, Ecclesiastes is the output of a social experiment by the wisest man ever to live before the Lord Jesus Christ. It was King Solomon. God endowed him with great wisdom and he wanted to know uh, the best way in which people should live. What's the best way to live your life um, under the sun, you know, with, without God? He did all kinds of things. He built a lot of things. He hired a lot of people. He had a lot of parties. He pretty much explored every type of enjoyment that people could have. And in the end of it, in our chapter 2, well, he actually ended up saying that he hated life. He found it all very vain and empty. And so what did he actually conclude out of that? Well, it's in verse 24. There's nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labour. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. And so... Enjoy what you've got. You're not going to get enjoyment out of great buildings, out of great um, parties, these types of things, great wealth and riches. The place was so rich back then that silver wasn't counted. It was like rocks on the road. Just excuse me while I kick this piece of silver out of the way. Um, so that was the type of situation where, where Solomon found himself. And he said that to enjoy the good of your labour which anyone can do in a, in a simple or a, maybe a, a grander life, he says that's a, a, a good thing. But we can add to that if we come over to the New Testament and we take some words from the Apostle Paul in 1st of Timothy and chapter 6. So 1st of Timothy chapter 6. We might just start from verse 6 where he advises that godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice that word contentment. For, he says, we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. So he says, and having food and raiment, food and clothes, let us be therewith content. He says that's, that's enough. So the Bible encourages us not to seek more and more and more, and some have done that. Some very rich people were asked how much is enough, and they said a bit more because they were hooked. It doesn't bring satisfaction. It just is a, a vain cycle. But marketers sell that lie because you buy things. Um, but being content with small things is the Bible's advice. And allied with that is the advice to not spend your time accumulating wealth. Let's look at some examples here. So, so firstly, from Proverbs 23, um, we're going to turn a few of these up because it's just good to look at them together. Not all of them, but, but uh, quite a few. So Proverbs 23, and this is from King Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes he says, actually starting from verse 4, labour not to be rich. He was very rich. It wasn't what he had originally asked God for. 
He wanted wisdom, but he says, don't labour to be rich. And what does he say in verse 5? Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So it's a vain thing to chase riches. And the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, well, he actually added to this and uh, tells a very powerful story. So he says in Luke 12 verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Yeah, you can have a lot of riches and wealth and whatever, but it doesn't add to your personality. It doesn't make you a nice person. It might make you able to help others, perhaps. You might be able to have a bit more comfort, but um, it doesn't add to your quality as such. And then he tells this story about a rich man whose land was very, um, very fruitful and he's got so much that he can't store it and so he buy, goes and builds bigger barns and then the trouble with that is that he's told that night, you're going to die, bang, he's gone. What was the point? And so Jesus says, your life doesn't consist in the abundance of things that you possess. So money is a tool, not an object of worship. Maybe you've heard the expression, money is, the love of money is the root of all evil. Again, straight out of scripture. That's straight out of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. So another one of those sayings that's pretty well known um, that's come straight out of the Bible. So that's advice that the scriptures give us. Money is a tool, not an object of worship. What about our behaviours? Well, we're told to focus on each day um, more carefully because ultimately tomorrow never comes, does it? Today is the day of opportunity. This is exactly what Christ taught back in Mark, Matthew, sorry, chapter 6, when he was teaching his disciples um, about looking too far ahead. It doesn't mean we don't plan, but it means we have to be um, a bit more mindful of the present rather than having our mind constantly in the future. So Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 34, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. So he says there's enough to worry about today rather than getting all caught up about what's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean that we don't plan, but we just need to be um, careful that we don't go too far with that and that we don't miss the opportunity now. So today is the day of opportunity. And in James uh, chapter 4, which, which we won't turn up, but he uh, warns against people um, speaking very confidently about what's to come in a couple of years. I'll go to this city for a while, then I'll go and do this, then I'll go and do that. Well, again, like the man back in Luke 12, how do you know you'll even be alive? Um, but he's warning us against presuming that that will just happen as we've, as we've planned it. It will happen if God will, so God willing. Um, that's where that, that expression comes from. We're told to use our time well. Now there's a couple of examples there from the Old Testament. So Genesis 21 is actually uh, Abraham and Exodus 24 is Moses. And on both occasions, it says that they rose up early. I know that um, it's not always common for people to be morning people, but uh, that's, that's a lesson that we do get from the Bible is use your time. Um, and we probably find that at times. You get up a bit earlier, you're amazed how much extra you can sometimes get done. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, that's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says that um, he got up a great while before day. So he got up really early. And uh, certainly, there's no better example of someone who used their time very well in terms of what he got done in his ministry. So the Bible encourages us, use our time well and uh, it does encourage us as an example to get up early through the examples of those from the past. Be honest in what you say. So we're already in Matthew. So if we just look at chapter 5, 
probably don't even really need to turn a page. Matthew 5, Jesus says to his disciples, let your communication be yes, yes, no, no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. Now, it's probably something that, that we associate with politics a bit, often higher up in businesses. Uh, people have a very smooth way of speaking. Um, yeah, it's, it's often um, easy to see that, that something's being said that, that's a bit deceptive. What Jesus is saying here is, you get asked a question that's a yes, no, give a yes, no. Don't give a five minute diatribe on, on uh, why you're going to do something and then not do it or, 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 some, or whatever. Um, so he says, speak plainly. You get asked a yes, no, say yes, no, depending on what the answer is. Whatever is more than that comes of evil, he said. It's, it's deceptive, and it is. So that's a strong encouragement from Christ. And James, in his letter, um, and uh, chapter, chapter 5, he echoes that. So let your yes be yes, let your no be no. So be honest in, uh, in, in what you say. Speak less and listen more. There was a, a very good saying that, got around in the past, maybe not as common now, that God gave us two ears and one mouth to be used in that proportion. And James chapter 1 gives us uh, a biblical basis for that very good advice for our daily lives. So James chapter 1 and specifically verse 19 where James says to the believers, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. It makes sense to, to speak less and listen more, doesn't it? Because if you listen more, you learn more. And uh, what you say is uh, probably going to be a better, educated, a better educated thing. And funnily enough, you see it more and more now in articles, etc., that it's it's not good to be the loudest person in the room. Um, that's something I've read a bit online, that, uh, that actually to be a person who's a little quieter and a bit more discerning and, and a, a listener, that's actually respected more. So that uh, advice comes out of, out of the Bible, to be swift to hear and slow to speak. What about another one? So practicing self-control. Self-control is a very valuable thing that the Bible gives us advice on, uh, on building. So there's, there's two sides to that presented in the Proverbs. And um, I'm sort of jumping around between various books here, so you don't need to turn them all up. But, but the first one in Proverbs is chapter 16 and verse 32, where Solomon says to the reader, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. So Solomon says, and the Bible says to us, this is ultimately the word of God speaking, says that to have, rule your spirit, to rule your inner person, to have self-control is better than being able to take a city, which is viewed as a very grand thing and certainly was, was in those days. And uh, there's people in the world trying to take certain cities right now. And even if they did that, well, the Bible would say to rule your spirit, to have self-control is better than doing something that's apparently as grand as, as what that is. In contrast, there's also the other side of it in Proverbs 25 and verse 28, which says, he that has no rule over his own spirit, no self-control, is like a city that's broken down and without walls. So that speaks of weakness and vulnerability, doesn't it? That's the, the type of picture we get from a city without walls that is, uh, that is broken down. So the Bible encourages us to seek to have self-control. So that's more advice for our daily lives. And of course, not all of this is easy. A lot of it's not easy, but it's very sound advice from the, the best advisor in the universe. So we are well advised to hear it. Well, here's another one that, that we get, and this comes from the Proverbs as well, which is to seek wisdom. So to actually seek wisdom, because wisdom is a, is a very 
important thing um, in this day and age as much as any. To actually be wise is a valuable thing. If you're wise, regardless of the context you find yourself in, you'll be valuable. And that's the type of intent. It's not a case of seeking wisdom so you can sit on a pedestal or something and, and uh, it's a kind of self-aggrandizing thing, but it's more because it makes one useful. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Um, I've actually jumped the gun there. That's the wrong quote. We come back to that one after. But um, it's actually Proverbs 4 that I was after. Proverbs 4, starting from verse 7. But we'll come back to that one that I, I read after because that's a, a useful one about our associations. So Proverbs 4 and verse 7, speaking of wisdom, says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, that's, that's wisdom. Exalt her, she shall promote you. She shall bring you honour when you do embrace her. She shall give to your head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to you. That's the benefit of having wisdom. It's a very great help in life. And another one from the Proverbs is to not follow the crowd, especially when they do evil. I remember back when I was in high school with the, with the other kids, we, uh, we got plenty of exhortations about not following people who are doing the wrong thing. Um, I think you probably relate to certain things like if such and such jumped off a cliff, would you? Um, we've probably all heard that in our school days. And uh, it's a clear lesson from the Bible, particularly Proverbs 1, and there's a section there, verses 10 to 19, that says, you know, if sinners entice you, don't consent, don't go with them. So our younger people probably um, can relate very much to that because they would, they would get that one a fair bit. But in any age, that's important counsel to not follow the crowd, especially when they're, they're doing evil. Following correct principles and the right ways, that's what we are advised to do. And it makes sense, doesn't it? We know that by experience, that that's the right thing to do. The Bible tells us that good piece of advice too. Be responsible with your resources. So this one here, um, this comes out of the law of Moses and that particular example speaks of encountering a, a bird on a nest. And so God spoke to the people through Moses and he said, if you find a bird on a nest, well, you can take the eggs, you can take the chicks. Don't take the bird, because, of course, a bird can make more eggs and more chicks. So it's a sustainable thing, isn't it? We hear the uh, importance of sustainability in our present world. Well, well that's it back there, and it's, it's good advice to be responsible. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you clear out every, every resource, well, you, it's great for today, but you don't have anything for tomorrow. So we're told, be responsible with our resources. Don't retaliate. Uh, we're told to take the higher ground. And this is a very hard one for us because if someone um, attacks us, well, we probably want to attack them back, don't we, in some way. But we're encouraged by, by the Lord Jesus Christ. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, uh, that there's a better way. It's not easy, but it's better. And so reading from Matthew 5, verse 39, Jesus says, I say to you that you resist not evil. Whosoever will smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's not easy to do. If a man will sue you at law and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. So it's the picture of a one-sided dispute, a one-sided battle. It's hard for something to escalate, really, if there's only one person in that, uh, in that fight. But again, very, very difficult to actually do that, uh, but that's the advice we're given. The Apostle Paul builds on that a bit in um, Romans chapter 12, if you'd just like to come there with me. We'll turn this one up. And there's a couple of others there that are that are very important as well. A um, couple of other verses that you might like to note down. 
So Romans 12 is filled with uh, sort of punchy, short encouragements of, of what to do. And there's, there's a whole heap of advice there in itself, which you might like to read after, um, particularly verse 7 through to the end of the chapter. But the bit I'm focusing on here is, is this topic of, of how we respond when, uh, when attacked in some way. Verse 17, Paul says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. So don't pay them back their evil with, with more of it. Um, and then jumping down to verse 18, he says, If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. So seek peace. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. So don't take revenge, he says. Rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So God will judge, but uh, it's not for us to do. So he says, therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's a, a challenge for us, but it, uh, it diffuses a situation, doesn't it? Unlike situations that we could probably see playing out in the world at present, where one person does something on an international scale and then up it goes and the stakes keep getting higher. Uh, we're seeing that in Ukraine where the egos of, of various individuals are probably being um, pricked and they're, they're responding with more and more aggression to one another. Well, Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ encourage us in our lives to, to diffuse those situations, not, not escalate them. So very, uh, very powerful advice, even though it's hard to actually do it. And we're told in our day-to-day -day life, don't, don't judge others, don't hold grudges against them. James 5, 9 says, don't, don't grudge against people because it's actually quite serious. The judge stands at the door, he says. Um, I heard another expression once that, that is uh, just in the, in the common vernacular, but it's um, resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And it's very true. As much as it's not a good behaviour and it's, it's condemned by the Bible, to, to hold grudges and to be resentful, well, it's actually um, very, very bad for you. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. It doesn't mean we just allow anything, that we go along with any behaviour, that's not the point. But regarding ourselves as the judges of all other people, we need to be very careful of that. What about our relationships? Well, we're told in the Bible to choose our friends carefully. So let's just turn these up. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27 verse 17. And in this case, um, Solomon says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. So if you, if you hang around the right people, they will make you better and you will make them better. So iron sharpens iron. That's a great little picture that we can see of like a, a steel and a knife and there's a few sparks coming off, um, but one makes the other sharper and better. Well also, and, uh, and I read this before in my haste, I uh, was getting ahead of myself tells us that he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So choose your friends carefully. And again, that's advice that's great for us at any age of life, whether we're young or old. By their fruits you shall know them. So the Lord Jesus Christ gave this very powerful teaching in Matthew chapter 7, and he, he uses the analogy of trees. We've got a few fruit trees in our garden. One of them at the moment's got heaps of apples, it's an apple tree um, and we've got a plum tree and we've got various other trees. We know them by their fruits. Um, and so Jesus uses this to describe the way of, of uh, discerning, you know, people who are maybe good to be around and those who aren't or really knowing someone. Um, by their fruits you shall know them. And so he talks about their fruits as their behaviours. And so if you see a lot of bad fruit, you probably know it's a bad tree. A lot of good fruit... Well, that's, that's 
you know, obviously a commendation to that, to that tree or to that person. And so Jesus gives the, the example and he, and he actually is speaking about the leaders of Israel in that day. They were supposed to be the spiritual leaders, but he says, look, if you observe those people, there's some pretty concerning things there. Um, but that's a principle that the Bible advises us on in general, that, uh, that we can learn a lot about other people by careful observation, not in an accusatory way or something like that, because that doesn't go with the spirit of it, but it helps us to be wise and, and uh, to make good choices with, with who we associate. Submit to one another. Again, not very easy, so that's a bit like the one we, we uh, saw before. So Ephesians 5 verse 21 and also Philippians. So Ephesians says to, to submit to those around. Ephesians actually, Philippians actually says um, to esteem others better than yourself. So to take a spirit of humility. So that spirit of humility and, and to submit to one another, it's a very, very powerful thing. Okay. Now, what I wanted to do was just to focus on three more. But these ones I thought are just great to pick out, and there are others, but these are great ones to pick out because modern research is showing some really amazing things about these biblical pieces of advice. So in Acts 20 verse 35, we have here some words recorded that were spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not actually recorded in the Gospels anywhere, but they are uh, recorded by the Apostle, or spoken by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts and recorded by Luke, who wrote Acts, um, and particular chapter 20, verse 35. And the teaching that Jesus had given was that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So to have a spirit of giving and service is better to have the spirit of, of taking. And we probably know that that's right anyway, don't we? That's, that's a fairly fairly simple thing to, to know. But it's interesting to observe what research has started to show in the area, area of psychology. So this is from um, an article called The Neuroscience of Giving by uh, Dr. Eva Ritvo. The happiness trifecta, helping others triggers a release of oxytocin, which has the effect of boosting your mood and counteracts the effects of cortisol, the dreaded stress hormone. Interestingly, the higher levels of oxytocin, the more you want to help others. And when oxytocin is boosted, so are serotonin and dopamine, so other hormones that are released by the body. So, so Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that's a good thing from a spiritual angle and for the general health of society. But it actually has the effect of, uh, of boosting your mood and, um, and helping you feel better as a person. So this is how powerful um, biblical advice can be. So uh, that's, that's quite a remarkable one, that to, to give and to have a spirit of service, well, it actually does great things for you. Um, and it's interesting because I... I heard a, a TED talk a while ago where this was being discussed and, and in this TED talk this, this psychologist said the same thing and they, they described it in the terms of involuntary acts, oh, sorry, voluntary acts of service. So you're volunteering to do something and they said that research actually showed that those who do that, who are, have a spirit of service and giving doing that actually strengthens the parts of the brain that tend to having more self-control. Just as a, a very interesting little aside, um, so the whole picture kind of goes together. That uh, the, the scripture says earlier, um, self-control is good, and to have a spirit of giving actually strengthens the brain in that area. So, quite a, a remarkable thing that may not have been obvious. So, biblical advice is good, isn't it? Be thankful. Here's another one that research is, is showing um, a, lot of, a lot of gems in relation to. So this is from the Harvard Health Publishing. Um, so, so Harvard is a fairly big institution in the US. So from 2021, the article, Giving Thanks Can Make You Happier, says in positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. Happiness is something that basically everyone wants, isn't it? You don't find too many people that say, I don't want to be happy. 
It's a topic that gets discussed a lot and it's, a, it's the question, how do you be happy in life? That's kind of what Solomon was looking at in his social experiment in Ecclesiastes, um, is what is to bring satisfaction and happiness to a person. So gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity and build strong relationships. So being thankful can lead to all of that. And the Bible says in many places, be thankful. So that's some more great advice. Well, one more. This is uh, out of the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. And uh, he's starting to wrap it up in, in Matthew chapter 7. But he says, All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So that last expression there, this is the law and the prophets, what he's saying is the Old Testament was pointing people in that direction. Love your neighbour, do good to others. Um, if you want people to do something to you, if that's what you'd want them to do to you, do it to them. And it's a wonderful rule. It, it was called the golden rule, I believe, in, in past times. Because no one would want someone to, to um, speak wickedly of them or to do evil to them, to steal from them or anything like that, would they? None of us want that. So Jesus is making the point, if you want people to do good to you, do good to them. And that rule is incredibly powerful. Imagine in this, in this world if everybody operated under that principle. You wouldn't find a whole lot going wrong, would you? Obviously as people we, we fail and we don't always live up to it, but if that was the intent of everyone on the earth, to do good things to others because that's what you would have them do to you, well, it would be a much better place, wouldn't it? So that's, that's great advice that, that Jesus gives to us all. Because um, this is another topic that, that you know, is, is probably being emphasised more and more as we see wars breaking out, etc., is that people kind of want to see unity and, and um, good agreement among people. Well, you know, biblical advice leads us very strongly in that direction. Well, we've looked at the fact that the Bible has great advice for our everyday lives. And again, what I've provided there is, is a bit of a snapshot. There's a lot more to be found and I encourage you to keep looking for yourself because it's all, um, all there and there's, there's a lot to be a lot to be found. But if we're willing to look firstly and see that the Bible is actually in our society still, it's in our sayings, it's in our laws, and these are good things, these are, are powerful things that we can relate to, and if we can then see that the Bible, as we've seen, has good advice for us in our everyday life, well, wouldn't it then make us want to take a step further? Because the Bible doesn't just stop with advice for daily life. It's got advice that can save our lives. In Acts 17, the Apostle Paul was in Athens. And essentially, what we have on the screen there is the Apostle Paul introducing the Athenians to God, who they had never heard of. And so he told them all about the fact that God is the creator of all things. We are his children. He's made the earth. He wants us to look towards him because he's our father, we are his offspring. And uh, God requires us to repent because he's going to judge the earth by the man who he sent, Jesus Christ. So this is the very pointed and clear uh, advice from an, from an eternal angle that the apostle gave to the Athenians. And he gives it to us as well because there's a day coming, is the advice we're given. A day is coming in which God is going to judge the world in righteousness through Jesus Christ. And so the Bible advises us to repent, to be prepared for that day, because the day is fast approaching and uh, the signs are clear. And so, therefore, friends, um, we would invite you back next week to consider more of the, the power of the Bible, that it is the Word of God, and uh, 
would encourage you to continue to be instructed by it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dan. It's truly been an in interesting insight into what advice the Bible has given that has held for many centuries. As Dan has mentioned, the uh, God willing, our uh, the topic for next week is uh, fulfilled prophecy, the evidence of God. As always, remind that there is the uh, literature out in the hallway if you want to look at some of those things. So. Um, we have a supper tonight, so we're just going to close now with a prayer and give thanks for that supper. Thanks. Almighty Heavenly Father, we praise you again, that great God eternal, that God of wisdom that has given us in the Bible words of wisdom that has held for centuries words that we can learn from, learn words that we can use to enhance our mortal life, words that we can use to make our lives a happier place for ourselves and for those other people in this world. So God, please let us always think upon these words of wisdom, to think of things such as contentment, uh, that we, these might be things that drive our life. Now we realise, God, that these are things that help us right now and these are things that are your principles and we know that in following your principles allows us to become closer to you. And we'd ask that always that we might look forward to those things of you and to those things eternal. But we thank you for all those temporal things too. We thank you for the food that we have. We thank you for this opportunity we've had tonight. We'd ask God that you would be a strength to us as we go our ways in this following week. In the name of your son Jesus we pray. Amen.